Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask him uh, to help us now as we open his word together to give us understanding, to give us conviction, uh, to give us hope in our great Savior. Our God and our Father, we thank you in the name of your Son, by the power of your indwelling Spirit. Will you give to us the help that we need? We, we confess that as we open your word together, we, we are not even able to understand it as we ought to understand it. Much less could we obey it. Much less could we utilize it to save us and to sanctify us in the truth. So we need your, your kindness, your mercy. We need your power uh, to work within us, to work among us, uh, to accomplish your purposes, to reveal the great love an atoning work of Christ in us and through us, to unify us, to be of one mind, to be as one man standing before our Savior. We ask all of this in his name. Amen. As you're taking your seat, turn with me to Acts chapter 6, and you may be thinking, what are we doing? Where are we going? That's a good question. It's a reasonable question. I, I had intended, in fact, I mentioned uh, several weeks ago that I intended to do a, a short series from the Psalms before we go to our, our next you know, book series. We'll be looking at the Gospel of Mark uh, sometime soon. Uh, I, soon's a relative term, but sometime soon. But we have a, we have a deacon ordination coming up in two weeks uh, in which J. Michael will be ordained as a deacon. And I had planned to, to preach on that day a sermon on the diaconate, on deacons and and as I looked back through my notes, I, I haven't taught extensively on that diaconate, diaconate in years. In fact, all the way back to 2013 was the last time I did an extensive sermon on that. I think 2018 was the last sermon at all. And as I looked around the room, many of you weren't even here then. And so I thought, well, let's do a, a short series then leading up to the ordination of deacons. Well, then, if you've read the children's book, Give a Moose a Muffin, this will make more sense to you. Having looked at that, if I'm going to do, I'm going to do three on, on deacons, I might as well approach the duties and functions of elders, and well, if I'm going to go on that far, I might as well do the duties and responsibilities of church members. So that's where we'll be, as I've sketched this out, probably the next eight to nine weeks or so, uh, we'll be there. So as we look at Acts chapter 6 this morning, we'll be in this same text, by the way, for the next next three weeks. I think there's a lot more here than meets the eye. And what we want to look at is, is first of all, in our task today, the title of the sermon is From Discord to Unity. From Discord to Unity. We need to understand, before we even look at questions like how, how do deacons serve, or, or what do they do, or who should be a deacon, before we get to those questions, those are important ones, we need to start with why questions. Why is there a diaconate to begin with? In Acts chapter 6, I'm convinced, I'm not alone, the majority of, I think, conservative theologians would, would say that Acts chapter 6 represents the appointment of the very first deacons in the New Testament church. And the deacons were appointed in a particular context. That context was controversy. It was disunity. It was, it was a, a, a very real threat of a fracturing within the body of Christ. And into that situation, on that occasion, deacons were appointed. So we're going to deal today with some particular issues with respect to disunity in the body. But I say all that to say, this is not because I'm addressing a particular sin that I'm aware of in the congregation today, or that I'm, I'm concerned in a particular way about disunity among us right now. But in order to set the stage and to set the table properly for a conversation, a, a, a sermon series on the diaconate, I think it's necessary to lay that groundwork. So let's think about it this way. Have you ever been to the scene of a recent disaster? We're, you know, a coastal kind of community, so many of you have seen the damage that a hurricane can bring. Or maybe it's a, a, a wildfire. Years ago, we had some, some fires up near Bastrop, and even to this day, as you drive through, you can see the scars of that. Uh, I grew up in, in North Texas and Northwest Texas, and that hurricane, or not hurricane, but tornado country, tornado alley. Many times I have been on the scene in the aftermath of a tornado. And, and some of the scars that are on the landscape 
whether it's a hurricane or a fire or a tornado, last for years. But not only in the land, but upon the people who are affected by it. And I don't think it's hyperbole to suggest there's something very similar that happens within a church when there has been major division. There are scars upon the landscape that can last for years. There are wounds that take years to heal. Luke begins and ends this particular passage, and I'll read it in a moment, but right before chapter 6, he, he makes a comment about the growth within the church. And in verse 7, at the end of the section we'll read today, he makes another comment about the number of the disciples increasing. You know, that's a good thing. As I look around this morning, we have very few empty seats. We've been growing. That's a great thing. It's a blessing of God. We've prayed for this for a number of years. But we also have to be wise and recognize when there is growth, there are also temptations towards disunity. There are problems that can emerge as a function of that growth. So what we examine here, we need to understand in light of of this fact. So what Luke is doing here by sort of bookending this passage with statements about growth in the church, it's like he's taking out his highlighter and saying, this is important. I want you to take note of this. This is happening on the occasion of the church growing and prospering. Now, in the background, because we wage not battle against not flesh and blood, but again, in the background of this, is a spiritual attack upon the church. We see evidence in the first several chapters of the book of Acts. In in chapter 2, we see Pentecost and the pouring out of the Spirit of God, and the church is is, is growing. 3,000 souls were added that day to the church. Chapters 3 and 4 show the, the devil's first attack was persecution against the apostles. Peter and John are arrested. And they end up praising God because they were able to go on proclaiming the name of Christ, preaching in his name, declaring his gospel despite the persecution. Well, the second wave of attack seems to come in chapter 5, the attack of pride and the sin of self-exaltation with Ananias and Sapphira. And we won't read the story, you know it, but Both of them, husband and wife, are struck dead because of their boasts to the congregation that they had sold a piece of land and were giving all of this to the church, promoting themselves, looking to make themselves look wonderful in the eyes of their brothers and sisters. Well, now in chapter 6, we see the attack coming in a different form. This time it comes from within. But we need to recognize it is nothing less than a spiritual attack. It's come from inside the ranks of the church. Now, there's more here to consider than what we're able to cover today. So next week, we'll look at the division of labor that the apostles propose, or in command, actually. And and then the following week, we'll, we'll look more at the specific qualifications for deacons that are laid forth here, and also more thoroughly in 1 Timothy 3. So as I said, this will end up being a series of sermons, first on deacons, then on elders, and then on church members. Um, the, the philosopher Aristotle introduced the concept of, of telos. It's the Greek word telos or telos, and it literally means with the end in mind. And what the idea is that the purpose for which a thing is created ought to guide how we evaluate that thing in terms of its function and its use. So when we think about the diaconate, I want us to think about the telos the purpose. What was the occasion? What was the purpose of these first deacons? And I think that will help us better answer the questions, such as why do we have them? How do they serve? How are they chosen? What should they do? Those questions are all very important, but if we don't get to the telos, the purpose of them first in our minds, fixed there, we'll struggle a little bit with the application of it. So I'm going to divide the text in, in, in three ways. Again, we're going to come back to this over the next couple of weeks and really let let ourselves sort of marinate on the Word of God here. But notice, first of all, there's a serious threat within the church. So if you're taking notes, if you want just a a, a shorter outline, an internal threat. Secondly, we, we see decisive action on behalf or on the part of the teacher leaders. Again, if you want something shorter, apostolic instruction. And thirdly, we see a comprehensive response from the body. 
So in other words, the congregation responds to the apostles' teaching. Let's read together the Word of God. This is from Acts chapter 6. I'm going to read verses. I'm going to back up and read the last verse of chapter 5, and then verses 1 to 7 of chapter 6. And every day, in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because of their widows being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, who, will, who we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicolaus, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. May the Lord bless the reading and the preaching of his word. Let's note, first of all, this serious threat that comes from within. Luke tells us, in these days, what days was this? It was, it was the days of the early church. This is the infancy of the early church, and it is growing rapidly. It's growing under the power and the presence of the Spirit of God. And in those days of increasing number, a complaint arises between two groups the Hellenists, and the Hebrews. So who are the parties to the complaint? Well, these, these Hellenists were Greek-speaking Jews. Greek was the, the, the official language of the Roman Empire. So an, a, by analogy, English is the official language of business all over the planet today. In, in the ancient world, Greek was that primary language. And there, was, there were two different groups within this Jerusalem church. What had happened, there had been a large dispersion of Jews, and some had become, as they became Christians, were moving back to Jerusalem. But you had two different groups, and it was more than just a language issue. The Hellenists were not only Greek speakers, but they had been immersed in Greek culture and thought. They were Jews, they had now become Christians, but culturally, they were Greek. And then you had the Hebrews, who spoke either the Hebrew language or probably more likely Aramaic, or Aramaic, it was, it was a, another Semitic tongue. They were culturally Jews. So what Luke is setting up for us, and Luke uses, throughout his, his narrative and acts, he uses understatement a lot. And he's, he's using understatement here. You have two different ethnic groups, two different cultural groups. There are also linguistic issues. I mean, you know, if you've, if you've uh, many of you, English is not your first language. But it, those of you who've, who've, who've talked with someone, even someone who knows the language well, but they're bilingual, sometimes it's a nuance in a word that can cause a misunderstanding, isn't it? So even in, linguistically, there were difficulties, but culturally, there were differences. They were united in Christ, but there were still some real differences. Now, the question is, is so a complaint between the Hellenists and the Hebrews arise. And it, what we're told is that the widows of the Hellenists were being neglected. Now, the Hellenists were very likely the minority group. The Hebrews would have been the majority. The minority group is concerned that their widows are being neglected. Now, you know, Luke doesn't have to explain this to us, because this is, this is common to human nature. If somebody's mama is being shorted, do you think that's emotionally charged? See, we have ethnic strife, potentially. We also have this idea that my mother is being neglected here. And there's a zeal to, to obey the Old Testament commands to care for widows. So you've got a, a potential tinderbox, an emotionally charged issue within the congregation. We have to ask the question, is the complaint legitimate? 
is the question legitimate? I mean, is the complaint legitimate? It, were, were, the, were the Hellenist widows really and truly actually being shorted, or was this a, a perceived a gri- grievance? Well, then there's a, a, a follow-up question. Does it matter? I mean, think about this. In, 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 those, in your own family, in churches you've been a part of, in your workplace, whether the grievance is real or not, can it still cause a problem? Of course it can. Now, there's evidence within the text and the way in which the apostles respond that the, the grievance was genuine. It was legitimate. And I think that's clear in the way both the apostles respond and then later on we see the, the congregational response. I think they understood it was, it was legitimate. So if it's true, then, there must be the presence of, of sin to some degree that needs to be dealt with. There is a failure of duty before God to provide for the poor and particularly for widows. If, this, if, legitimate, if the complaint is legitimate, then God's word is being violated because there was a command on God's people to care for the widows and particularly those among them. For example, Deuteronomy 10, and I can give you dozens of examples, but Deuteronomy 10, verse 18. God executes judgment, or justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing Love the sojourner, therefore, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. Throughout the Old Covenant, there are three categories of people, three groups of people who God says particularly ought to be cared for, the widow, the fatherless, and the sojourner. It is very likely that the Hellenists were examples of two of those categories, both sojourners and widows. So it was a problem that this was not being addressed. But... And there is a but. The ESV does not really help us here by using the word complaint. It says that a complaint arose. The the New American Standard and others use the same word, but that doesn't really capture the flavor of what's going on. Sometimes we hear a complaint, we can think, well, there was a group of Hellenists who, who, who called Thomas or Peter or John and said, can we make an appointment? We have a concern about something. We'd like to speak with the apostles about this and figure, we've got some some suggestions, and no, that's a complaint. This was not what this was. The the word literally is, in in the Greek, it's the gongusmos. Now, you don't have to be a Greek speaker to recognize that that's not a good word, gongusmos. It's almost onomatopoeia. Now, onomatopoeia is something like squeak or hiss, where the word sounds like what it is. This was a word that means murmuring, grumbling. One Greek dictionary says it's a low and suppressed discourse. The expression of secret and sullen discontent, muttering, murmuring. See, the English word murmuring kind of captures this. Murmur, 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 murmur. It just doesn't sound good, does it? See, if words had a smell, this would not be a good word. Like I remember my first job out of college. I worked for Cisco Foods. So... We had a small office on the third floor of a bank building in College Station, Texas, and there were a group of guys that we were sales reps, and, and one guy in particular was just not well-liked in the office. He was a, kind of a braggart and kind of an arrogant guy, and he went on vacation. So a couple of his coworkers took a single, solitary, raw shrimp and put it in his desk drawer on the Friday before he was to return. He returns on Monday, and... <laughs> So two or three days, this is getting worse and worse and worse. And finally, he discovers the source, and he was obviously not happy. But that's the idea. Here's this murmuring, like like a bad odor that rises to the ears of the apostles. This complaint just sort of drifts up to them. It's not a formal, orderly registering of a complaint. It's a secret murmuring. Now, against whom were they murmuring? Because Luke tells us there's a complaint or a murmuring arose by the Hellenists against the Hebrews. But that's not the full story, is it? Because let's look back. Look back at chapter 4. Turn back just a page in your Bible to verse 35. Or verse 34. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds that was sold... And note this, and they laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. 
Just a couple verses later, verse 37, they sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it where? The apostles' feet. Chapter 5, verse 2, Ananias and Sapphira sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. See, the apostles up until this point had personally been in charge of this distribution. So when the murmuring arose between the Hellenists and the Hebrews, it was not really against the Hebrews, was it? It was against the apostles. It was a direct attack, or I should say an indirect attack. It was the murmuring, secret, covert kind of attack upon the leadership of the New Testament church. Now, what potential harms are present here? Let's, let's think about this for a moment. What potential harm is here? Well, we have the disruption of unity, obviously, in the congregation that's at, that's at risk. We have a corruption of their public witness. Several times already, up to this point, Luke has articulated how fear had come upon even outsiders. Now, what kind of testimony would it have been to see this church so recently bestowed of God's Holy Spirit to fracture and split in two? Now, it, it led to the possibility of suspicion among other church members that, that could fester and have long-reaching consequences. It, it, it threatened to, to, to thwart the growth of the Word of God because the apostles were now distracted and taken off task. The soil here then becomes fertile for all kinds of false doctrine, for all kinds of heresy. There's a failure here for the, for the church to continue in the Great Commission that our Lord had just given them in chapter 1. Back in 2012, Ray Ortland wrote a short piece entitled How to Rescue, and he used air quotes, How to Rescue Your Church in Three Weeks. Week one, walk into church today and think about how long you've been a member, how much you've sacrificed, how underappreciated you are. Take note of every way you're dissatisfied with your church now. Take note of every person who displeases you. Meet for coffee this week with another member and share your heart. Discuss how your church is changing, how you're being left out. Ask your friend who else in the church has concerns. Agree together that you must pray about it. Week two. Send an email to a few other concerned members. Inform them that a groundswell of grievance is surfacing in your church. Problems have gone unaddressed for too long. Ask them to keep the matter to themselves you know, for the sake of the body. As complaints come in, form them into a petition to demand an accounting from the leaders of the church. Circulate the petition quietly. Gathering support will be easy. Even happy members can be used if you appeal to their sense of fairness, that, you're, that your side deserves a hearing. Be sure to proceed in a way that conforms to your church constitution so that your petition is procedurally correct. Week three, when the growing moral moral, can even say it, when the growing moral fervor, ill-defined but powerful, reaches critical mass, confront the elders with your demands, inform them, that all, inform them of all the woundedness in the church, which leaves you with no choice but to put your petition forward, inform them that for the sake of reconciliation, the concerns of the body must be satisfied. Whatever happens from this point on, you have won you have changed the subject in your church from gospel advance to your own grievances. To some degree, you will get your way. Your church will need three or four years of recovery. But at any future time, you can do it all again. It only takes three weeks. Just one question. Even if you're being wronged, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, why not rather suffer wrong? I was saddened to think about this. I actually pulled that quote from a sermon that I preached in the middle of 2013, and not even a year and a half later, a group of men in our own church did exactly this, uh, and their wives. And of course, the sin of, of murmuring, of grumbling, is not new, is it? God rebuked his old covenant people for this very same sin. So do you think the apostles were attuned to this? Do you think when this murmuring kind of wafted up to their nostrils, 
they thought, man, we've got to deal with this. Because we've heard this before. In Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 26, Moses teaching on behalf of the Lord, he said, Yet you would not go up, but rebelled against the command of the Lord your God, and you murmured in your tents. You murmured in your tents and said, Because the Lord hated us, he has brought us out of the land of Egypt to give us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Do you see how, how toxic this is? In their tents, meaning in their private homes, they murmured against the Lord and said, It's because God hated us that he rescued us from Egypt. You know the story. You know what was going on in Egypt. It wasn't because God hated them that he took them out. It was out of his great love. He heard their cries, and he rescued them. But this is the, this is the perverting aspect of sin, the blinding aspect of sin. It changes our perspective. Notice that in, in, in their tents, it's, just, it's, it's, it's covert. It's, it's clandestine kind of murmuring. And, and here in, in Psalm 106, then, there's an unnamed psalmist who connects directly their murmuring with God's condemning them to abide in the wilderness and die there. Psalm 106, verse 25, they murmured in their tents. They did not obey the voice of the Lord. Therefore, he raised his hand and swore to them that he would make them fall in the wilderness and would make their offspring fall among the nations, scattering them among the lands. The psalmist makes a direct cause and effect relationship. They murmured. God was angry with them, and he sentenced them to die in the wilderness. That's how serious this is. Paul, writing to the Philippian church in Philippians 2, he says, do all things without grumbling or disputing. Paul recognized this temptation exists in the New Testament church as well. So do you find yourself tempted in this area of grumbling, murmuring, complaining, what thoughts occupy your hearts? What words are found on your lips when you return to your own tent this afternoon? What, what occupies your mind? What's on your, on your mouth? The answer, the answer is not pretending that there are no problems. There is no perfect church. You know this, I hope. If not, you'll know it soon. There's no perfect church. So, so the, the answer is not pretending here that there's no legitimate problem. We see in the response from, from the apostles and from the congregation, this was a legit problem. But on the front end, it was not being handled well. And so the, 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 the instruction from God's word is not, to, is not that we don't deal with legitimate issues. It's that we deal with them in a God-honoring way. That's the lesson. Will we pursue God-honoring means of addressing the problems when they arise? So this is potentially a huge problem. It's a tender box of grumbling, ethnic strife, cultural, linguistic difficulties. And the apostles needed to act decisively, and that's exactly what they do. Look, look next at verse 2. End of the 12. By the way, it's the only time that Luke refers to them as the 12. And I think it's to contrast them or, or to compare them with the 7. But the 12 summoned the full number of the disciples. Now, by this point, this is, this is thousands. We know in chapter 2 there were 3,000 added in a single day. The church has continued to grow. So there are several thousand members of the Jerusalem congregation, and the apostles summon them all, the entire number. And they said this, it's not right, or literally it's not pleasing in the sight of God that we should give up preaching the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit, and full of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So there was decisive action on behalf of, or on the part of, the teacher leaders. Notice, first of all, what they didn't do. It's helpful sometimes to observe what didn't happen. The, the apostles did not join in the murmuring. That's pretty critical. The apostles didn't join in the murmuring. They didn't respond in pride with things like, how dare you criticize us? You could have taken it very easily, very personally, because they were the ones responsible for this distribution. How dare you? We've been appointed by Christ. You can't criticize us. Touch not thine anointed, right? They did not minimize the complaint 
They did not minimize the potential impact on the church. But they also did not scold or rebuke or mock or or do anything to add further division to what was going on. They took it seriously. They did not attempt also to solve the problem by themselves. They didn't look for a top-down solution. You know what? We're going to retire to our private chambers, the 12 of us, and we will come back and tell you what the solution is. They summoned the entire multitude. So nothing was done in the dark. And I think there's, there's an there's a, a incumbent here, by the apostles' example, it's incumbent upon leaders to set the example of what the Scriptures command to us, to seek wisdom, to seek safety in a multitude of counselors. And the apostles are applying that wisdom. But, at the same time, the apostles did not abandon their God-given authority to provide oversight. They didn't just say, y'all go figure this out. They instructed the church members in their shared duties, and, and then they said they would lay hands on the men that the congregation chose. Notice what happens here. Luke, again, he understates intentionally. Think about this. Just, just reason with me for a minute. They've gone through the trouble of calling a meeting, of assembling 3,000 plus, probably 5,000 plus people. And Luke gives them two verses. Do you think the apostles said more than that? Do you think, well, we've got 30 seconds, we're going to gather everybody here, 30 seconds, and now y'all go home. No, that's not what happened. Luke is economizing here. He's describing the the central things, but what's happened here? The apostles preached to them. They taught the people from God's word how they should respond to this situation. And they said, literally, it's not pleasing to God for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. They're setting a priority, not because it's, it's, they're saying that the serving of tables is beneath them. That's not the case at all, because they had already been doing that. They had already proven that was not beneath them. Nor were they saying it was not important. In fact, they were actually saying the opposite. Because we recognize this is important, and because the demands of ministry have grown to this degree, we can't keep up with it. We're not able to meet the needs of God's people. There needs to be a division of labor here. And what Christ has appointed for us, and this is not negotiable, Christ has appointed us as apostles to teach, to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not pleasing to God for us to set that aside, to do what God has directly called us to do, when we can, in a sense, delegate for these other tasks that God has not specifically called us by way of office to do. That's the distinction they're making. So he's not saying it's unimportant or less important to serve tables. He's saying, by way of office, this is not what God's design is. And they taught the people of that. And specifically, they reminded the church of, I think, three important things. They reminded the church of her duty, of her capability, and of her shared purpose. Now, let's think about those. In their teaching, and we we can see this even just in the brief account that Luke gives to us, surely more words were said than these, but they reminded the church of their duty. It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God in order to serve tables. They recognized the serving of tables was a necessary duty that was given by God's word to God's people. Again, it's not arrogance on the part of the apostles, but but rather an exhortation to the church that this problem actually belonged to every member. The command not to neglect the widow, the sojourner, and the fatherless, that command rested upon the shoulders of every follower of Jesus Christ. That was not unique to the apostles. So they said, this is your duty as a church body. We have some among us, some of our dear sisters, our dear widow sisters who are being neglected. It is a duty of the church to provide for their needs. That can't be set aside, but we have been given a specific commission by Christ to proclaim the gospel. It's not pleasing to God for us to set that aside in order to do this other duty. And as much as she is able, the body of Christ has a duty to provide for her own, and especially for widows and the fatherless and the sojourner. Now, that's their duty, but he also reminds them, they also remind the people here of their capability. 
He says, they said, pick out from among you. Look at your own ranks. Look at the membership here of the church and pick out from among you seven men. Seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and full of wisdom. He's reminding the church, there are resources here that God has already given. There are gifts. There are personalities. There are abilities here that you already possess. It's time to set them apart for this work. There is a capability already here in the body of Christ. Now, they're likely drawing from the the account in the book of Exodus. And you can go home and read this if you want to. In Exodus chapter 18, there's this really dramatic scene when Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, visits one day. And you remember this? Moses is sitting there, and from morning to evening, every day, Moses is dealing with all the ordinary daily disputes between the people. And Jethro sits for a while and watches this. And at some point, Jethro says, you know, this isn't good, Moses. You're going to wear yourself out. You're going to wear the people out. This is not good. You need to appoint men. And if you go and read there, the qualifications are almost word for word. Men who are wise, men who hate a bribe, men who have a good reputation. See, the apostles aren't inventing things as they go along. They're not not making things up as they go along. They're looking to the word of God for their guidance. And they said, we've seen this before. We've seen a necessity of a division of labor already in our history. Moses employed this. In fact, Moses heeded the advice of his father-in-law, and things improved greatly. And Moses was given a specific priority of doing what? Teaching. Teaching the laws, teaching the statutes, teaching the ordinances, so that the people, one, could solve their own problems, and two, so that other men could come along and help them, because sometimes all of us get stuck in a disagreement and need a third party to help us, help us see how foolish we are in some, some of our perspectives. So the apostles reminded them the capability is already here, just as it was in our people of old. The Lord has not left his church without sufficient resources and gifts. Christ has promised to build up his church, to fully furnish her. And they're also instructing that a healthy reliance on only certain men to meet the needs of the, of the church is not healthy. For the church of Jesus Christ to be reliant upon only these 12 apostles, to be that kind of top-heavy, in the long run isn't healthy. And they're recognizing that. And let's take note of this. Even the seven isn't the only answer. We're not given all the details here. But just think this through. Let's just say there's 5,000 people here. Is seven men sufficient? No, these are seven administrators. These are seven leaders. These are seven men who have given the task to organize things, again, so that the whole body could exercise her duty. And they taught, no doubt, the people that in the long term, the growth of the church would be hindered if everybody was looking to the apostles to satisfy every need, to referee every dispute, to counsel every hurt. That was not going to work. It was not going to be sufficient in the long term. So they they reminded the church of of her duty, of her capabilities, and also of her purpose. No doubt they took the church back to the Great Commission and said, we have been called to preach this gospel, to be witnesses of Christ from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and under the uttermost parts of the earth. That's non-negotiable. We can't cast off that assignment that Christ has given to us, and the whole body needs to do what only the body can do to love her own, to care for her own. And so the very purpose of the congregation, members, deacons, elders, all have different duties, all have different gifts, all have different places of service, but the same responsibility to Christ, the same common purpose under the the Great Commission. So in a sense, they are refocusing the church. Sometimes we have to do this with our children, don't we? You get distracted with all that. Here's this dispute, and here's that dispute. Wait, wait, wait. Here's what you're supposed to be working on right now. It's math time, right? Or it's history time. Set aside those other things for now. And so in a sense, the the apostles were doing just that with the whole church, saying, we have a problem in our midst, but here's our focus. We We can't beg off of this mission. Christ will not allow that. We must focus together 
divide our labor where it's appropriate, and get on with the business of proclaiming the kingdom of Christ. John Stott said the devil's next attack was the cleverest of the three. He's, he's referring to the attack of persecution, the attack of, of incepted pride with Ananias and Sapphira. The devil's next attack was the cleverest of the three. Having failed to overcome the church by either persecution or corruption, he now tried distraction. If he could preoccupy the apostles with social administration, which, though essential, was not their calling, they would neglect their God-given responsibilities to pray and to preach and so leave the church without any defense against false doctrine. Now, let's think about the comprehensive response from the body. And this is glorious when we, when we ponder what, what happens here. It, it's an amazing work of the Spirit of God through His Word being declared. So we see the success of this plan ultimately dependent upon the response of God's people. They had to hear, believe, and obey the Word of God. The apostles obeyed Christ by teaching and by serving as examples. And the people obeyed the Lord by putting feet to the instruction that they received. Verse 4 tells us, or verse 5, I'm sorry, what they said. So this is following the sermon, or maybe a series of sermons. What they said, what the apostles taught, pleased the whole gathering. See, we have a unity of mind already born out of the Word and Spirit. Before they had ever done anything to solve the problem, we have unity restored by means of the Word through the Spirit's power. They were pleased before even any man was selected for the task. See, they had set their minds to be of one accord together in Christ according to his great commission and according to the purposes and the responsibilities given to the church. They eagerly sought out unity amongst themselves. The apostles had successfully redirected the priorities of the church. See, they weren't looking merely to put a stop to the complaint, or to the murmuring, or to the grumbling. They were looking to get to the root of the problem. They were looking to address, what are, what are the roots here of this issue? They didn't just create a program to, to make the, the, the problem go away, or to make the symptoms of the disease kind of stop, so to speak. Look what happens. They pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. That extra description is important because the very next chapter we see Stephen as the first martyr as he preaches the word of God. And Philip and Procurus and Nicanor and Timon and Parmenas and Nicolaus, a proselyte of Antioch. These, these men, they, meaning the, the congregation, set them before the apostles and they, the apostles, prayed and laid their hands on them. Does something stand out to you about the list of names? They are all, or almost all, Greek names. Now remember, the Hellenists were probably in the minority. It was their complaint that arose against the Hebrews. Now, in, in ordinary group dynamics, how does this work? We've just seen our, our Congress work for multiple days with 14 votes trying to figure out who's going to lead, right? Norm normally... The majority gets its way. What we would expect is for there to be seven Hebrew names. That's not what we find, is it? All, or almost all of these, are Greek names. These were representatives of the Hellenists. You see the work of God and his spirit within the congregation, where they say, you know what? Christ and his gospel are most important. Our own, you know, our own teams, not important. Our own social, ethnic, linguistic identities, not important. In comparison to, doesn't mean they're irrelevant. They didn't take the, they didn't take the, the, the position here, oh, we're just colorblind. These differences don't matter. They took them seriously. But they also took them lovingly and said, we're going to appoint men who are best able to wade into a tinderbox. So when we think about the diaconate, before we ask, what are the qualifications? 
Or who should we choose? Or what should they do? We need to ask, what kinds of men do these need to be? Are these peacemakers? I mean, fundamentally, in their demeanor, in their reputation, are these men who seek peace and know how to get it? Are these men who are willing to wade into controversy and be able to reconcile two brothers together, two sisters together? Or are these the kind of men who like to put gasoline on the fire, like to provoke things, like to inflame things? See, the majority put the needs of the minority first. They were obedient to the law of God regarding widows and the fatherless and the sojourners. They put their obedience to God's word first, not their own preferences. The Hebrews demonstrated in a very tangible way the superiority of the gospel that Jesus taught. Remember, Jesus would, would confront, he, he, he confront the, the Jews, the leaders of the Jews, and he would teach his disciples, don't be like them. I mean, they greet each other in the marketplace. Who doesn't do that? Everybody does that. Everybody loves their own. But, but my ethic, my gospel produces in you a love of people who are not like you. My gospel unifies you with people who are not the same as you. And, and they're, this is bearing fruit, isn't it? Luke tells us that the word of God continued to spread after this, which means the changes they made were genuine. This wasn't just a structural, superficial, organizational change. This was a fundamental reality that the people of God embraced. That the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the advancement of his kingdom, the declaration of his law and gospel were more important than their own differences and their own preferences. In what ways do you murmur? Notice I didn't ask, do you murmur? I don't have to ask that. In what ways? And I'm not asking you to stand up and, and confess right now, but, but do, do, it may not be against the church per se. It may be against your, your own wife, your own husband, your own brother or sister or mom or dad. In what way does that, that sin of murmuring tempt you or ensnare you? Ask the Lord to give you eyes to see how serious this sin, this sin is against him. Not even against one another first, but against him. And against his body, secondly, an entire generation of people God left to perish in the wilderness because of this very sin. And, and the writer of Hebrews says it's unbelief is what it is. So when, again, not if, when you feel slighted or you feel neglected in some way in this body of Christ, go to your brother directly, go to your sister directly. And, and we all need to learn to anticipate this. We need to learn to anticipate it. Because, it's, again, it's not an if, it's a when. When this happens, when you see things in this church that are being neglected, and I can tell you there are things presently and there will be things in the future that are being neglected. When there are important matters that are not being adequately addressed. How do you respond to that? How do you address that in a way that honors the Lord? There will be times when things don't work out like, they, like we want them to. And we have to be able to discern, is this just my own preference? Or is this a legitimate need? You know, in the case of the widows, that was a legitimate need. God's word clearly says you need to provide for them. Those who cannot provide for themselves, you need to be able to provide for them. And the church wasn't there was kind of a lapse, logistically or otherwise, and that wasn't happening. So how do we respond? I mean, we know murmuring is a sin. It's likely, to some degree or another, we all need to repent, don't we? But we all need the grace of God's repenting work in us to turn away from this. And again, I'm, I'm not aware of any particular thing. I'm not addressing a particular issue right now. But, that, but isn't that all the more reason uh, to guard our hearts and minds in, in a day of peace, in a day of harmony, but also in a day of growth? So that's what we don't do. But what ought we to do? 
what ought we to do? When inevitably you see a deficiency, you see a defect, you see a problem, you see a difficulty at GFBC Conroe, or you see a difficulty in another sphere in which you're involved. How do you respond? Well, we know the, the proper response is not to your tents and to your murmuring, right? That's not the answer. See, the food distribution was a legitimate problem. There was some defect, there was some deficiency in that. And based on the, res the, the apostles' response and the body's response, I think we can safely conclude this was not a false complaint. It was a legitimate problem. The first thing we need to do, of course, is, is to assume the best about the other party. What's the temptation here with, between the Hellenists and the Hebrews? What's the temptation when the Hellenists feel like their widows are being neglected? Well, the temptation, of course, well, the Hebrews always do this. They're always against us. They don't like it. I think they're better than us. I mean, you, you know where that goes. Assume the best. Secondly, recognize that real differences may exist between us. There may be real differences. With the Hellenists and the Hebrews, there were real differences. They didn't pretend otherwise. They didn't seek to say, well, we're, we're all that has, all, in Christ, all those differences has been just been flattened out and there's, there's nothing. No, they recognize there are differences here. But we have a greater surpassing unity in Christ that needs to be fostered, it needs to be cultivated, and it needs to be worked at. Remember our common mission, our common purpose, to participate in the proclamation of the gospel. You know, in, in, in Paul's first letter to the Corinthian church, he, he adopts this wonderful analogy. He talks about a body, and a body has many parts. Does the eye say to the hand, I have no need of you? Not everyone's a mouth, not everyone's an ear, not everyone's a, an ear or a, an eye or, or a hand. And then he takes that analogy. He says the body is like that. The body, the whole, has a purpose in the Great Commission to declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. You may or may not be a mouth. But your hands, your feet, your ears, your eyes are necessary to the work of the kingdom. And we have to remember that common purpose. Do your best prayerfully to discern when you see something, ask yourself, is this a personal offense? Is this a preference that's being violated? Or is this a genuine need of the body of Christ? Is there a legitimate deficit that I can point to the Scripture and say, we are supposed to be doing this and we are not doing this? Or we are supposed to not be doing this and we're doing that? We need to learn in every sphere in the church, in the civil sphere, and others, learn to value leaders that God has sovereignly and purposely placed over us. And recognize imperfect, broken clay pots have been called and purposed by God to be useful in his kingdom. Well, we recognize that. The apostles, contrary to what Rome taught, there was no infallibility in the apostles. Not even Peter. And you, you don't need to spend a whole lot of time in your Bible to know that. Peter was not infallible. The leaders are never infallible. So the admonition isn't to touch not thine anointed and just do whatever he says. No, that's not the case at all. But recognize that, that in God's wisdom, this is, this is whom he has raised up and appointed. So if you have an issue, go to your deacons. Go, go, come to me. And, and, and speak frankly, candidly. There's nothing wrong with an orderly complaint. The sin that we find in Acts 6 was murmuring. It was the secrecy of it. It was, it was, the, it was the kind of, 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 of activity that undermines the very foundation. Think about this. You ever think that maybe some of the people in the congregation in Jerusalem didn't like Peter's leadership style? You ever think that maybe some of them had gone to John for private counsel and were not impressed with what he said? You ever thought maybe someone went to James and, and found that Dad, James is just so wooden and hard? Or they went to Thomas or Andrew or one of the others and found deficiencies in their 
demeanor. Just didn't like them. Or that's not really my cup of tea. That's the reality in almost any church, isn't it? See, we must not deceive ourselves and think that we're, we're, we're running the only spotless ship on the sea. We've got to recognize that there, there are deficiencies, but has God given us means to correct those? GFPC Conroe needs the eyes and the ears and the gifts, the spirit-given gifts of every single member. Of every single member. Sometimes there's that, that's the gift of, of perception, of seeing things. You know, in your homes, dads, you know this. If, if you've been a dad very long, you know this reality. You've come home from work one day and your wife's saying, you know, there's an issue we've got to address. What are you talking about? I haven't seen that. And your wife is able to help you see something with your children that you haven't been able to see. Maybe because you just weren't there. You know, mom's got more, sometimes more on, on, uh, hands-on time. Other times, just God's gifted her to see things that you'll never see. Given 100 hours, you'll never see that. A church can be like that too. And a member might perceive a need, a legitimate issue. Things that can come to the, to the deacons, come to, come to me and say, Pastor, I think this is a problem. Can we work on this? See, that's a good thing. The murmuring, the secret complaining is a sinful thing. But that's the distinction. Are we, are we willing to be part of the solution? I mean, anybody can, can complain, right? Ask me how I know. I'm, I'm, I'm a world champion. I'm a gold medalist in the art of complaining. Anybody can complain. But typically, there's only a few who are willing to do the hard, sacrificial work of solving problems. And that's true in your workplaces, too. It's true in your extended families. It's true in your homeschool co-op or wherever else you, you are interacting with other people. There's usually a handful who are willing to give of themselves sacrificially for the sake of others. You know, you've heard the 80-20 rule. 80% of the, or 20% of the people do 80% of the work. Well, sadly, a lot of times in churches, it's more like 95-5, 90-10. But there's a call here to the entire congregation, be willing to give of yourself, be willing to sacrifice of yourself for the sake of of your brothers and sisters. So, over the next couple of weeks, we're, we're going to flesh this out some more, looking at, at the diaconate, looking at deacons. And so, with this telos in mind, this idea of with the end in mind, uh, one of the interns for Capitol Hill Baptist Church several years ago, a young man by the name of Jamie Dunlop, wrote an essay. I thought it was a really great illustration. He said, deacons are shock absorbers. So in your car, you have a shock absorber. So you hit a bump, the springs bounce, and the shock absorber helps steady and level it out. Deacons can be like that. So as we think about how we choose deacons, who should be deacons, and, I, and I, so we, we've already had one that we've elected and, and will be ordained in two weeks, but I, I suspect there are other brothers among us that the Lord may raise up to serve among us. And before we ask the question of who or what they should do or how do we call them, we need to wrestle with this idea of why. What's the governing purpose? What, what's the blessing that God can provide to his people through a healthy diaconate? Our Lord Jesus has given to us, to us his great commission. He, we have together an opportunity to grow in trusting that he's going to supply every need that we have, every legitimate need that we have as a congregation. We, we learn together to trust him for that. So let's pray together. Father, you are a good and, and gracious God. We thank you for the wisdom of your word. We thank you that you have, have ordered your church and ordered your people in such a way that we can be confident that your kingdom is going to advance. Father, forgive us for our sins in general, and particularly the sin of, of murmuring and complaining. We pray that we will come to understand by your Spirit's help that that sin really does undermine the very foundations of the gospel. That the sin of murmuring hinders 
our love for one another. It hinders our unity. It hinders the work of the ministry. It hinders the advancement of the Great Commission. Lord, grant to us the grace of repentance where, where it's needed. Grant to us a joy in, in learning to cultivate unity. Grant to us a, a, an excitement in seeing brothers and sisters reconciled together. Not because we've pretended that differences don't exist, but because we've recognized that Christ is far superior to anything that may divide us in this age. We ask all this for Christ's sake and for the good and the unity of your people. Amen.